Good afternoon to you. Mark Sabbath, HurricaneTrack.com here with your hurricane outlook and discussion. It is Monday, September 28th, 2020. I'm finally back home after being on the road for quite a few weeks. Rounded up all the equipment that we could uh, from Laura and Sally and Beta. Um, I say all that we could. There's still a couple pieces that we still need to get, um, but we'll worry about that down the road. We've done the best that we can. Retrieved a lot of data, a lot of great video, and some of the video will be used as data. So all in all, a very successful last few weeks, despite the fact that I have been gone for quite a long time. This pretty much beats um, anything in the past. Even in 2005, I was not gone this much. So it's good to be back. So let's start talking about what's going on in the tropics. Love the graphic here from Kari that produces this for us these little thumbnails over in the UK. I like today's, very nice. Uh, and here we go. This is the starting point for the basis of where we're gonna go from here. The sea surface temperature anomalies, we visit this a lot, and it really does help to sort of set the stage as to where we are and where we might be going. And you notice in the Atlantic, very warm through the main development region, very warm through the Caribbean, and generally warm in the Gulf, although the Northern Gulf has cooled off a little bit relative to average. And then the water temperatures here are a little bit cooler. There's the cold wake left over from a couple of hurricanes out in the vicinity of Bermuda. But I think the big thing that should jump out is the very obvious La Nina pattern in the tropical Pacific, right along the equator here. Um, water temperatures you know, a half a degree to a degree Celsius below the long-term average. And this La Nina keeps on strengthening. And it'll be interesting to see. I know it's just late September, but what if this holds on into next year? You know, we might have back-to-back -back busy seasons. It's just something to think about as we go forward. And it does have a lot of implications too. this very cold water relative to average, that is. Uh, changes the weather patterns around the globe and we can talk about what that is later on probably in October or November as we resurrect the Hurricane U educational series and uh, where we really dig into what some of these weather patterns are all about more of the nuts and bolts of it rather than just a general overview we'll talk about La Nina and the uh, likelihood that it holds on through the winter and the spring and what might happen in 2021 not only with hurricane season but you know regular old weather outside of hurricane season and it's really neat to be able to plot these uh, as Levi does on a graph and you can see since the uh, early part of the summer over here it's just been a downward trend and there you go the daily value is minus 0.87 and that's definitely in La Nina territory, and it'll just be a question now of how strong does the La Nina get and how long does it hold on in the tropical Pacific. In the meantime, and conversely, wow, the main development region, I didn't know that this was the case. There's the MDR, and look at that value, 0.86. That's the warmest that I have seen in a long time. And it has stayed above average here since about mid-July when it really spiked up and then we had these different dust intrusions etc but boy it's really come up here the last few weeks at the peak of the hurricane season which is interesting because we have not had particularly strong hurricanes out in the open Atlantic between Africa and the Lesser Antilles like we did for example in 2017. We had Irma firmly entrenched out that way uh, Jose and Maria, those were all classic main development region hurricanes. You know, we had Paulette, we had Teddy, but nothing with that kind of water temperature profile. We haven't had a lot in the way, I mean, just, that was it, Paulette and Teddy, honestly. And the, the big impact storms formed farther to the west uh, for the United States. Obviously, Paulette impacting Bermuda directly, but Isaias and Hannah, Laura and Sally and Beta and others all forming and having impacts much farther to the west. But nevertheless, there's the main development region quite a bit warmer than the long-term average, and we'll have to just see how long that persists. 
And of more importance, perhaps, here as we go through the next several weeks is how warm the Caribbean is. And we're talking 1.1 degrees Celsius. That's incredible. It's more than a degree Celsius above the long-term average. And this will have implications going forward between now and the end of November as the Atlantic hurricane season enters into uh, the last couple of months of the official season. So warm temperatures relative to average across a pretty large area juxtaposed or you know conversely um, situated as it were to this La Nina. So interesting pattern in terms of actual temperatures. Look at the Gulf of Mexico here. Cooled off a little bit. The shelf waters up here close to the northern Gulf 27 degrees Celsius or colder and so for the most part unless you get a fast moving hurricane that would be coming in like that. This is just an example. Um, you're not going to have much in the way of a, a chance for major impacts. This is far different than what we saw two years ago when we had uh, Hurricane Michael up here. Water temperatures two years ago were much warmer this late in the season. Uh, it was just a different pattern. It was very warm over the southeast that year. Uh, this year we're dropping this cold front down. We've already had one recently. We've had storms stir everything up. but Farther to the south here, the rest of the Gulf is plenty warm for activity. And then in the Caribbean, of course, 28, 29, 30 degrees Celsius in some locations. And South Florida, your best chance for a major hurricane, believe it or not, is October. Uh, Brian McNulty had tweeted about that earlier that we saw over time 16 hurricane uh, you know, encounters, if you will, in September over time, if you look at it over the past, you know, more than 100 years, 22 occurrences in October. So October wins out there, and the ones in October usually come around from this way, coming out of the Caribbean for the most part, where is in September, they usually come from the southeast, as you can imagine. Um, so South Florida, you're not off the hook yet. Um, in terms of any activity that may come your way, whether it's a full-fledged hurricane or a tropical storm with a big rain event, um, we just don't know. But you know exactly how things are going to turn out. But the water temperature is still supporting uh, activity if it were to come your way. Off the mid-Atlantic, shelf waters have cooled off in my neck of the woods here in the Carolinas down to Georgia. Now 24, 25 Celsius, not warm enough to support a tropical system, but Again, if you were to have something like Matthew that came up off the coast like that or whatever, you know, if it's fast moving, you can still get some impacts, make no mistake. But the warm water temperatures of the summer are gone, which is unfortunate because I like the beach. I like, I mean, I can, you know, 24 Celsius is not bad. It's low to mid 70s Fahrenheit, but it's not that 82, 83 Fahrenheit that I thoroughly enjoy. We are in fall, and that's the way it goes. So all of that brings me to this, the uh, uh, respite that we had, a little bit of uh, calm between all of these hurricanes and storms that we've been dealing with. Well, it only lasted a few days, and now we're back at it with the Hurricane Center indicating now a medium chance of development down here, 40%. Uh, what they're looking at, and it's a complicated setup, is that a broad area of low pressure is expected to form over this region over the next few days and a tropical depression might form out of that as conditions are conducive i showed you already the anomalous warm water temperatures but it's not just warm water that gives us hurricanes right i think we know that there are other factors involved and that would be a pre-existing seedling and we can look out here and try to find uh, this is the area that we are concerned with right through here. And is there anything there now? No, there's not. So we look to the east. We have a system over here, a little bit more energy out over the western portions of the main development region, and some energy off the coast of Africa. But this is too far away over here to impact. I mean, this is later down the road, like many, many days. So these are the areas that we're watching right here. And how these pile into the Caribbean will determine what happens because the pattern looks like it's going to be generally favorable and in fact we can zoom in on the system here in the eastern caribbean this is a visible satellite 
shot. And there's still some fairly strong upper level winds, as you can see some of these clouds kind of getting pushed away as they move through, but it's not particularly strong. It's not overwhelming. And we do have lots and lots of lightning in here. That's what all those yellow speckles are. Uh, and people are noticing this. People that follow this kind of stuff, they know what to look for. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. But we do have this pre-existing area of showers and thunderstorms, moisture and energy. What we call vorticity is trying to tighten up relative vorticity. That's the way the wind blows and different speeds of that relative to the Earth's rotation. Uh, it's Earth relative vorticity instead of absolute vorticity, but that's we're getting into too much meteorology there, but we do. We have, we've got this pocket of energy that could be the seedling. Does it show up very much? No, not yet, but it is there. This is the area we're talking about right through here. So we can track this using the relative vorticity chart. This particular case, it comes from the University of Wisconsin. And there's more energy out here over the Atlantic, like I showed you. And all of this generally is going to be moving into the direction of the Caribbean over time. Yeah, probably. And that'll start to pile up. Uh, we got the La Nina here in the Pacific. And so the air is kind of slowing down as we come into the Caribbean, and that allows things to pile up. And when you pile air up, it converges or comes together, and it rises. It can't go down into the ocean. It starts to rise. And so this big piling up that we see um, because of the easterly trades bringing in these disturbances, and then we're going to get some cold air that's very dense uh, coming in off the uh, North American continent here. That's the front, and that'll help to... You'll have lots of high pressure over North America, and that'll help to lower the pressure and sort of feed the wind in here even more. So we're going to get a lowering of the pressures in the Caribbean. That's almost a certainty at this point. But what happens to that once it takes place? This is where we can turn to some of the experts that we follow, other experts. Um, and, you know, Jack Sillen, he does blogging and contributions for us at Hurricane Track and especially for our patrons. And he mentions that, you know, we've got these two systems, so we refer to that as bimodality. You know, bi meaning two in this case. So there's a bit of bimodality to the GEFS, which is the ensemble slow down mark, the ensemble forecast system from the GFS. And there's a bit of bimodality modality to that signal for the development in the Caribbean later this week. It looks like that the signal may be because of multiple disturbances that are trying to develop at the same time. And it's very unclear as to which, if any, of these disturbances will develop. So a quick screen capture that he did here just to show you from the Tropical Tidbit site, the ensemble forecast system here showing lots of areas of low pressure. These are all the different members of the GFS ensemble. You got little bullseyes in there where the pressures are lower. And this is against the um, uh, background state. So, you know, you see that they're lower to a certain extent, the normalized spread, etc. But bottom line is the more yellows and reds and oranges you see, the deeper the pressure, the lower the pressure is. So there's the first chunk right in here, first cluster. And this is out at about day uh, seven, roughly, 162 hours out. And there's the next cluster. And these are because of these two features that are moving through the Atlantic and the Caribbean now. All right, so let's go back to uh, this image. That's one feature there. There's the other feature there, I believe. May, might be something out here too. But as these pile in, like I said, they do different things. So the question is going to be, and, and is already, do any of these, or does any of these two systems, do any of these two systems develop? You know, and yeah, so there it is. There's one out here. There's another one here, kind of 1.5. So a lot of questions remain in terms of what will happen. Uh, and we can go back and we can see how this thread continues. Uh, Andy Hazelton also picking up on this. Um, and the 12Z GFS, and I know a lot of people are going to be looking at the model guidance the deterministic models, the 12Z, the 18Z, the 0Z, the 6Z, what do they each show? And it's really interesting, I will say this, it's interesting to see people already 
sort of planting their flag that they know what is going to happen. I will leave some of these people completely anonymous, but one such person, it just makes me chuckle, said on a message board, a very popular message board just a little while ago, that they fully expect nothing to come from this, that it'll be a sheared system with very minimal impact uh, and nothing really for the northern Gulf Coast. That And that person is a meteorologist, okay? I'll just say, it just kills me when people do this. That same person, two years ago, said the exact same thing regarding Michael. Should be a sloppy, east-weighted, sheared mess in the northern Gulf Coast. And he officially forecasted that it would be like 50, 60 knots or something like that. And we saw how that turned out. Now, I'm smart enough to know that not every situation is a Michael. But, you know, you keep planting your flag, and eventually it'll stick, right? Um, it's just, you, it's the, the, you can't do that. You can't say, ah, you know, nothing's going to happen. We're talking about a week out, especially this year when the global models have done so poorly. But you also can't look at a run where it develops something and say, okay, this is what's going to happen. That doesn't work either, especially in the ensembles. And so what we see here, and this is interesting uh, what Andy's talking about, that the 12Z run today uh, of the GFS shows basically a broad, large area of energy down there, what he calls a gyre. All depends on whether any of these particularly smaller vorticity maximas can get going. On this run, Nothing did, you know, and you see these little pieces here. Let me click on the image so it'll enlarge. You know, you see these little pieces. Let me use blue. Um, just as an example, there's a piece way up here. There's a piece here. There's a piece over here. You know, some larger vorticity over here. Uh, that's usually always there because of the Colombian, the way the winds blow through Colombia. And then a very large piece over here. Nothing ever really comes together. Look, there's a little tiny piece right there. There's another one right there. You know, nothing congeals on the 12Z run of the GFS. But it all just depends on, I guess, how the model feels at that moment, how these physics work. So the bottom line, at the end of the day, you know, what does it all come down to? Well, we, we know we're at the uh, part of the hurricane season where we got to watch this part of the Atlantic Basin, the Caribbean Sea, normally. I mean, that's naturally where we would be looking. So nothing to really hang our hats on at the at the time. Uh, the signal's there that something's going to try to develop. How strong or not remains to be seen. So, you know, that's it. That's all I got. Uh, like I said, it's good to be back. I'm going to be working on all kinds of uh, projects. we got to finish up three episodes of the Hurricane Highway. I've got five done. i got three more to go for the first season. Uh, we're going to be starting to work on season two uh, as we get into October, do some planning. Uh, work on funding for that, etc. Uh, figure out what all we got this year. You know, we still have hurricane season left. Don't worry. I mean, of course, you know, don't worry. But I'm not writing it off, is what I'm saying. It's not like it's over. But we're we're getting to the end, and we got to start looking at what we captured this year and figure out what we can do with it, who it can help, all kinds of stuff going forward. But the beginning of that is that I'm here, I'm finally back home in Wilmington, North Carolina, after a lot of time on the road. All right? All right. Well, it's good to have you guys along for all of that, uh, you know, through the YouTube, through the Twitter, the Facebook, and, of course, our patrons via Patreon who are funding this and helping to support it in other ways as well. It's been great to work with all of you and to see all of you, the interactions we've had. And, you know, we still have some time left on the clock. It's not over yet, and that's why we're here. So thanks for tuning in to this Hurricane Outlook and discussion. I do appreciate it. I am Mark Suddeth for HurricaneTrack.com. I'll be back, of course, with more for you tomorrow.